It's 1986, and I've never been to a real city, never someplace bustling. We live in Northwest England, the rural North, the poor North, the beautiful North. We live by the sea in a small village built after the war to house everyone who works at the nuclear power plant. It's so close you can feel the half-life in your bones. My parents are from this green corner of the world. Their parents are from here, and their parents, and their parents. Maybe if you go back far enough, there's some Viking blood in there, but you'd have to go back really far. We're leaving, but just temporarily. My dad is running the London Marathon. We're off to the city. He's always been a runner. Cumbria is considered the birthplace of a type of competitive mountain running known as fell running. Fells being mountains, muddy and rugged, and everyone just runs up them and down, and then you have a beer in the pub. Whether on roads or trails, my dad's fervor teaches me that running is just what you do. Everyone will grow up to be a runner. The best way out of West Cumbria is a winding, single lane thing of a road where you have to pull over for oncoming cars and for sheep. I'm six. I don't remember much about London or the race, but I do remember the silver, crinkly, magic space blanket my dad gets at the finish line. I just know that one day I'll get one of my own. I can only remember two times in my life that I've gone running with my dad, and only one of those was in England. My dad was pretty competitive, so running with his kid daughter stands out as one of the more patient things he's done. We run down the road from our house, not very far. We live right on the edge of the village, right where the fields begin, the cows, the river, the abandoned railway. The road isn't paved beyond our house. I bask in the attention and special seclusion of my time with my dad. Usually, he's the kind of father that when he gets home from work, my first feeling is fear, with, and with the click of the door and each overheard footstep in the house, I run a quick inventory of what I might have done wrong that day, what things might be out of place. Everything depends on his mood. But running together makes him proud, and he treats me like a peer. I love it all. Mostly I love the feel of my feet on the dirt, skipping past puddles. It's 1990 almost Christmas. I'm 11, in my first year at the secondary school in the next town. I find out that we're moving. We're not just getting a different house. We're not just leaving our village, our green and mossy corner of England. We're leaving the country, the continent. I can only really tell the friends I have time to see on Christmas break, and I'm pissed because my parents must have known for a long time. They went to visit San Diego in the summer, but didn't mention this. I try not to cry in the kitchen when they tell me. It feels the same as when I think they're getting divorced, and my dad tells me in the kitchen that I'm the reason he stays. It feels so much the same that sometimes I wonder if they're the same memory mixed together. We'll leave in January. We have two weeks to say goodbye to a whole country. We fly over the sea for hours and land in Chicago for a layover. It's Chicago O'Hare that gives me my first ever glimpse of America. As we walk out of the gate and into the airport, the first thing I see is three large men, their bottoms bulging out of their pants, sitting at a bar, eating hot dogs, and watching the Bears game. I want to cry, not because I'm sad about hot dogs or sports or butt cracks, but because this is so different. Nothing is the same. Nothing even smells the same and I want to go home where I belong. I don't cry because I don't want to have to explain myself. We're not in O'Hare for long, but it will never, ever leave me. When we land in San Diego, it's nighttime, and it's so very city. It's big, and there are so many lights, and the airport is right there in the thick of it. It's all pavement surrounded by so many large cars. When we drive away in the back of a red suburban, and there's that point by where the 15 and the 163 merge with something like 10 lanes of northbound traffic, and the car is huge, and the road is huge, and there's none of this stuff in England, and I'm probably going to die any minute. I just want to go home. My first day at school, the kids make fun of my accent. I cry, and there's snot all over my face. 
I hold out a handful of money for the cafeteria lady to pick from because I don't know what the coins mean. And she gives me a taco that I don't know how to eat. Nobody can understand me because West Cumbrian English is nothing like the English they've heard on TV. But they fake their own TV accents anyway to mock me. Or maybe just because I'm special to them. But it feels like mocking just the same. It's October 2013. Just like my father, I did grow up to be a runner. My friends and I sign up for a trail relay, 150 something miles over two days, overnight. Trail running's all I do now, my only sport, but I hardly ever run alone, especially not at night. I can't run my overnight leg with my teammates because they'll be resting before their turns. But I can have a pacer, someone not on the team who can run beside me. I need someone who could run on trails blindfolded, someone who still runs five miles a day, twice, someone who would probably do anything for me. I'm nervous when I call my dad, though I'm not sure what I'm nervous about. Am I nervous that he'll say something emotional and point out that I never ask him to run together? Am I nervous that he'll think I'm being a nuisance? Am I nervous because I remember being a kid and that and feeling that fear deep in my belly when he'd come home. But he's thrilled that I asked him. He says he'll train more. He says he'll buy a flashlight when I say it's required. But, he says, I won't need it. I never run with a flashlight. We're outside of Temecula, and it's so dry and brown here. The trail is sandy and loose. The mountains are gigantic. This is America. There's no mud, no moss, no cows. We have to worry about coyotes and mountain lions instead. I'm more nervous for how my dad will act around my teammates than I am for how I'll perform on the nighttime leg of the race. It'll be the easiest leg, the longest but flattest loop. I'm nervous that I'll have to talk to my teammates in front of him, that I'll have to switch back and forth between my long practiced, ingrained American accent the one I forced upon myself to stop being mocked at school, and the other accent I use, the one for my parents. I don't even know what that accent is. It's not even West Cumbrian anymore. It's just a remnant, displaced, like me. It ends up being no big deal. My dad is charming around my teammates. The moon is bright and the sky is clear, billions of stars, and it's cold. These things only matter for a moment before we set off and turn on our headlamps, and we're forced into this sort of tunnel vision, an insanely specific visual of the wilderness, but it's tempered by a more heightened awareness of everything else, sounds, smells, breath, everything. We run for about an hour and hardly see anyone. I'm so thankful for my dad, because alone I would be so fucking spooked out otherwise. I'm so thankful to be running with the person who inspired me to run in the first place, the person who led me to believe that running is just what you do. We talk, but mostly just about logistics, like, look how our lights work better when you hold them down here, and oh my god, did you see those paw prints? But we also talk about harder stuff we don't get a chance to talk about, and it's easier because we don't have to look at each other. He coaxes me, saying, come on then, get on up, as we go up the biggest hill. I'm annoyed because this is my second of three hilly runs, and he's just doing the one. And must he insist on always being two steps in front of me? But I imagine how it will feel later to have impressed him, and I speed up. Later, he proudly tells me how he counted all the people we passed. And our little team ends up winning the women's division. There's no division for eight women plus one old Englishman. It's undramatic as we finish the run and say goodbye, like everything about us. I'm emotional, but I try not to cry. Like that time in Chicago with the Bears fans. Like that time in the car on Interstate 15. Like that time in the kitchen when he tells me we have to say goodbye to England. England, the only place that will ever feel like home, like everything about us. Thank you.